should be starting to record now. Recording, recording is on. Today it's uh, July the 21st, and this is an Extinction Party meeting number 60. Blah, 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 blah. I can't remember exactly which one. Uh, but we have special guest uh, today, Joe Allen. And uh, Joe Allen is a, um, a blogger and came across. No, 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 uh, no, 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 no. A, a, a blogger, a blogger would be uh, like a, a digital bulimic, wouldn't it? I Always maybe. blogging. Okay. So a writer. I think a, a writer would be much more appropriate. Thank you. Okay, a writer and a very good writer, by the way. Uh, and it, it basically, I got from you uh, from your website. It was writes about ethnic identity, transhuman hubris, and the eternal spiritual quest. And uh, yeah, so the the articles that I came across were all transhumanist ones, and they they all kind of golden. Why why we are really excited to talk to you is because you think the same way about as as we do about tran transhumanism. And we're thinking of ways to, you know, basically counter it, to try and, you know, rebel against it. And so that's what we wanted to. But welcome. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Joe. My name is Sophie. Hello, Sophie. Very good to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So uh, am I to take so, yeah, it? I'm, you're, I'm you're, Hugh you're... and Michael. And Michael is on the I'm phone. Hugh and Michael is, is on mute, uh, probably at work. <laughs> so, uh, Hugh, am I to take it that you are an expatriate out on a ship somewhere in the Mediterranean? Yeah, I'm. A, I'm. A, I, I ceased it. So, but you know, it's, it's kind of my prepping strategy. I'm a bit of a little bit of a, a doomer, and so I thought, you know, I, I, I come from tech. I'm basically a recovering engineer. And uh, I just decided I can't take corporate America anymore. If I spend another moment in it, I'll die. So I figured that, you know, connectivity is just getting good enough that you can go to sea and sail around the world and just be able to, you know, keep a job for about six months before they get pissed off. Actually, I kept my job for about two and a half years before they got so pissed off and asked me. But um, it, it was just the right time to start as, you know, I sailed uh, around Europe and the Med and stuff. And, you know, for example, I just came to Spain when they were switching from 3G to 4G. So I could just do conferences like this and, you know, hold down a tech job um, with difficulty. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I had a director in front of me that was a Russian guy. And he he was terribly resentful. He came from he was relocated from St. Petersburg to a satellite office in Wales, and he, his ambition was get to get to the headquarters in Texas, but because he was Russian, he couldn't get a visa, and he absolutely hated it. And he hated the fact that you know I was <laughs> swanning around on a boat and stuff, and it, you know it just eventually did his head in. So he took the first chance uh, he could get to lay me off. But anyway, that's. That's me on a boat. <laughs> and, and, and Sophie, if I may ask, uh, where are you coming from? I'm a, I'm a recovering doctor, uh, specializing in women's health. I'm in Ireland from French origin. And in the west of Ireland, I'm a, I'm a gardener, I'm self-sufficient, and I, I do a lot of different things. So there you go. That's my background, really. That sounds <laughs> wonderful. You're welcome. <laughs> and Mike? Mike is... Mike yeah, I, I don't think Mike, Mike can talk, but Mike's in LA. Yeah. Mike's in, Mike's so, in LA. Yeah. So there, there are a small, small group of us. Um, the others on like um, Australia and stuff, and it's like three in the morning. So it's <laughs> the, the, this is not a good time for them. But yeah. Um, so let's talk about transhumanism. And, and have you sure. thought about countering it? Is, is rebelling against it? What what can we, the little folks, do? Uh, Non-participation, I would say, is the, the first step. Uh, you know, all of us have our limits as to how much invasive technology we're willing to take on. I mean, obviously, I'm coming to you on the internet and uh, using all the sort, same sorts of technologies that any average person would use. But I, I think that the last 10 years, maybe 20, has seen just an 
absolute shift in the way that culture functions, in the way that children are raised, in the way that the elderly are cared for. It, every facet of our lives has been in some way deeply impacted by all of these technologies, many of them invasive. So to me, uh, it's really a matter of where you draw the line and non-participation in anything that goes against your core values is the number one step as far as resistance goes. As far as active rebellion, I, I'm not so sure that there's anything to rebel against quite yet. Uh, I, I don't see outside of vaccine, de facto vaccine mandates, uh, anything that is being forced on us. Uh, but I don't think that that's going to last very long. And just like with the de facto vaccine mandates, you know, we're basically required to cultivate some sort of digital persona in order to exist in society. And as that trend continues, uh, you could say that to be a non-participant is, in effect, rebellion. But at the moment, uh, the answer to your or the, the answer to anyone's desire to drop out of the system and not participate is just simply, OK, good luck. <laughs> you know, so uh, no one no one has put us in a cage yet, at least not here. China, obviously, that's very different. Uh, and in a number of other countries, uh, it's it's very different. But. In America, uh, in, in Europe, by and large, uh, in most of South America and across the world, really, uh, none of us are having our arms twisted too hard to be here. We've just been enticed to be here. Yeah, so my thinking is that it won't last much longer that we, we're going to be forced in. This is kind of the same way as we're forced into vaccinations. Is It's not legally... It's just they make it functionally impossible to exist in the modern world unless you participate. And so, have you you've come across Alison McDowell? Have you? Uh, no, the name seems familiar, but it, it's possible that uh, it was from an email that you yeah. sent me. No, uh, say so, say more. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, Alison McDowell is really interesting case, and I highly recommend looking at her videos and stuff because. She's really a, a kind of ordinary soccer mom kind of thing, but she's an, an educator. And she came across the great reset and all this horrible dystopia that's coming down the line from like, you know, you know the fourth industrial revolution and Klaus Schwab's dystopian vision. And it kind of descended on her because she had to start doing these things like these, these uh, kind of play tables uh, for, you know, kindergarten kids where they're doing um, basically impact, uh, impact analysis and impact funding. Uh, for, they're using um, uh, impact tokens. So they sell tokens on the blockchain to these companies like BlackRock and uh, State Street, all these, um, these, these big hedge funds. Um, they're investing in uh, social responsibility. And so what, the way it works is they show something like, well, you can stop, if you intervene early with little kids, you can stop them, you know, becoming drug addicts. If they become drug addicts, it costs the state N, and therefore, you know, based on metrics, we corrected that behavior, therefore, the state owes us some portion of N, right? So they, it's preventive stuff mainly, and then it's it's for all aspects of social good. It's it's almost like carbon tax or something like that. But it's it's creeping in everywhere, and it's coming. Sure. You know, but it's a tsunami, and and so you can't really escape it because it, it's very much like that you know thousand K thing. You know the, the the welcome leak thing that you you yes uh, did did you do that article? You did that article. I did. Right? I mean, I, I wasn't, yeah. you know, I, I, it's more than I mentioned it, you know, obviously the person who did the real legwork on that is Whitney Webb. Uh, she's quite wonderful as a writer if, you, if you've never read her. So, so Alison McDowell is a kind of a Whitney Webb. And she, mm -hmm. when she found this stuff out, she started looking deeper and deeper and started doing, doing videos on YouTube and, you know, getting a little group together. Um, she, she doesn't really want to interact with us because she thinks we're too, um, well, we're not too hippie enough. You know, she, she wants to basically, <laughs> her response to this is like, well, 
I offer peace and, and dandelions. And I'm kind of thinking like, no, nah, the way I see it, this is like Hitler just marched into Poland. I think I want to do something a little more practical than dandelions here, <laughs> like maybe fight back. <laughs> and so, um, so she's very good from the point of view of she's just discovering all of this and she lays it out very nicely. She's, um, she's, she's quite a good academic. She's quite a good SWAT. SWAT. So, um, but yeah, I, th I think her approach needs to mature or her response needs to mature. Um, but anyway, anyway, she's, she's very interesting from that point of view. So, um, you know, look her up. You know, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I think we run into, uh, it, it, anyone who sees the writing on the wall and sees all of these powerful and influential people and organizations who have really big plans for us. Uh, and those of us who want nothing to do or very little to do with those plans. Uh, one of the things we run into is the Kaczynski uh, quandary, I guess you would say that uh, you, you come to a point where you realize that society is moving in a direction that you're not comfortable with, or you just completely revolt against. Um, you, you run out of options as to how to deal with it. Uh, you begin to sound more and more insane and are probably going insane. And before long, you're viewed as a potential Kaczynski, right? Now, if you've read um, the Unabom Unabomber Manifesto or uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the Industrial anti Society in its Future. Anti-Tech, the why and the how is, is really interesting, yeah. And yeah, but, got uh, a recent one out that's also interesting. Yeah, I, I, I've got it. I haven't, I haven't started it yet. I'm interested to read it. Uh, but I guess what I, what I mean is that, you know, Kaczynski in his early writing was extremely lucid. Uh, but the problem, obviously, is that he snapped and wanted to, you know, spark some sort of violent uprising against uh, the system or at least uh, contribute his own part to a violent uprising. Now, the minute you start going in that direction or you're even targeted as someone who's going in that direction, I mean, you're done, right? I mean, A, there's, you're not going to accomplish anything by physically attacking the people who are behind this. You're, you're nobody. And even if you were somebody, what have you really accomplished? All you've done is pretty much validated their point of view by not being able to debate it. Uh, but so, A... The first thing in my mind is to avoid the Kaczynski quandary, you know, just avoid it completely. Try to sound as sane as possible, which for someone like me is somewhat difficult, but I, uh, I do my best. Uh, from there, you're talking about an open public debate, and it is an open public debate to the extent that we are allowed to debate these things. But again, a problem that I think all of us run into is the moment you mention something like the Great Reset. Uh, not unlike after 9-11 when you started talking about the NSA or something like that. Uh, people who aren't already aware of these systems and aren't already aware of the organizations and the individuals who are pushing these systems, they immediately are triggered into this suspicion as to whether or not you yourself are a lunatic, right? Because they don't know about it. They're arrogant. They're so arrogant. They think that if they don't know about it, it must not be true. And so I, I, I think that for me, as a writer, the number one thing is to bring some sort of awareness as to what these predominant cultural trends are to people and hopefully encourage some sort of debate over whether or not the sorts of lifestyles that are being planned for us, the sorts of cultures that are being planned for us, and in particular, the amount of cultural destruction that is being planned for us is something that they want. I don't know that it's really that we've hit a tipping point that it's too late to turn back from. But undoubtedly, the COVID-19 pandemic and the response with the lockdowns and the total digitalization of every aspect of our lives that's celebrated by Klaus Schwab and many others, um, that's something that I personally uh, I want nothing to do with. I mean, these guys are fucking maniacs as far as I'm concerned. Brilliant, lucid, well-informed. Uh, I think that they have, in many ways, a beautiful vision of the world. It's just that I don't want a fucking thing to do with it, right? So, um, psychopathic. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was yeah. just going to say we're, we're faced with it. With you see, we're, we're trying to be lucid and sane 
but we are faced with people who are lucid and psychopathic, meaning no empathy and meaning not at all like we are. They're, they're functioning in another realm. So I know that you're the Kaczynski trap is, is, has to be treaded on very carefully. And uh, even though it's very inspiring and sometimes it's tempting to people like me even to, you know, but we, we have to, we, we, we went into that problem with Alison when we, we talked to her about what's her form of activism and uh, she, she she was she was not presenting a, a a strategy that was matching the enemy that we are facing and you know we are facing people who have absolutely no problem in eliminating enemies i mean they have, they have no problem in in erasing people you know, erasing identity, erasing culture, erasing social t social structures. So, I think it would be interesting to to debate on the form of activism, um, and and I would be curious to see what what you what you see apart from raising awareness. You know. Well, again, uh, so number one non-participation to the extent that you're able to and still survive in the current climate. Number two, raising awareness and trying to have some sort of public debate, even if it's on the fringes and makes its way towards the center, some sort of public debate as to whether or not a transhumanist lifestyle or just a completely technocratic lifestyle is something you want for yourself. And then more importantly, what you would want for your kids, or if you have no children and enough empathy to imagine future generations being worth something, future generations, is this the model by which you want these people to grow? So beyond that, there's only direct confrontation, right? Now we've seen already some direct confrontation with Davos. It's, uh, you know, it's been anywhere from, you know, activists who simply see them as elitists and globalists who, you know, gather together much like with the, uh, uh, the WTO uh, uh, protests uh, in Seattle, right? Anarchist types, or or uh, maybe uh, 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 the, the, the same sort of hippy dippy types. But then you also have the Alex Jones types, right? I mean, uh, he stood there in front of the the lines of cars coming in to the Bilderberger meeting with a, a bullhorn. It's like, I see you, I know you. So so Hillary Clinton, whoever. It it it. It was a double-edged sword in that it did. I mean, the public had no idea who the Bilderbergers were before Alex Jones, and 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 Davos has been a bit more on the radar. But I don't think many people are aware of it outside of kind of a lunatic fringe pointing it out. But when you talk about resistance, and especially you talk about confronting people like this, are you going to show up uh, in Davos in Switzerland and stand with signs saying, "I want to be a human, not a robot"? Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, you're never going to get a face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, debate out of Klaus Schwab or Yuval Noah Harari or any of these other cats. Uh, they're 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 in a, a completely different realm, and it really shows in their viewpoint uh, in regards to the wider populace. But what you can do, I, I at the moment hope, uh, is spread awareness of this encroaching lifestyle in a way that it wasn't done with the smartphone. People tried it. Uh, Nicholas Carr tried it, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Derek Jensen tried it. Uh, he tried to spread awareness of this, this kind of creeping uh, social structure that, that people were being enticed into adopting. It wasn't enough then. It may not be enough now. But I honestly, I don't see many other options because direct confrontation isn't enough. Uh, it, it, it ends up making you look like a clown and uh, it, it, it ends up basically delegitimizing all the people who are trying their best to maintain some sort of alternative, which the alternative obviously is, you know, the, the, the lifestyle that nature has evolved over the last 150,000 years or at least the last 10. So. And, and what about, yeah, I, what about sabotage? Uh, so, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> hang on. So, it's a legitimate. No, it, listen, it's a legitimate. A, a, a non-violent. It's a legitimate so, question. It's a legitimate question. So, so, but so, what I, what I, 
what I would what I would say to that is look at the way Earth First operated, right? And look at the attempts at sabotage that they made again and again and again, you know, spikes in trees and, you know, destroying equipment and occasionally attacking the loggers. And stuff. Yeah, the Sorry? weathermen and stuff were just didn't and, and the, the weathermen and stuff were just didn't so, so uh, you know, it, it seems like a good idea, I suppose, if you are completely detached from the consequences and you're completely uninterested in the ultimate consequences and simply want to, you know, express this frustration, it makes total sense. The problem is, again, it's insane. It doesn't, it, it won't work. Uh, it, it, it's, you're beating your head against the wall, more than likely to end up in some fucking prison cell somewhere. Um, and, and, and even if you get away with whatever sort of sabotage that you've got planned, uh, you've done nothing to legitimate the movement against these forces that are coming down on us. The only way a sabotage works is if the machine breaks. I don't there, there's simply no logical way for citizens to sabotage a machine or, as enormous as this. I don't even think that there's any possibility of stopping this machine. I think the machine will continue to roll on for decades or centuries until the power runs out. But what there is the pot from, from my perspective, what there is the possibility of doing is setting up cultural barriers to cultivate and continue to cultivate the sorts of naturalist lifestyles that have always nurtured human beings up to this point. And it's perhaps I am offering a dandelion to the lions, uh, but I, I, I simply uh, don't you, you are, but other I, have the, I have the solution. Okay. So, so you are offering dandelions. I have the solution. So, so why, let me go from the top. And I, this is—I don't think it's possible to drop out. Uh, That's—I I learned that from South Africa because, uh, you know, after the black people were defeated uh, in colonial times, in like, you know, after the Battle of Blood River, um, in the pre, in the 19th century, the black people went off. They just you know, went off and did subsistence farming. They said, okay, screw you. Uh, they didn't participate in white man's money because they knew it was a trick, <laughs> just dead slavery. And so they just went off into their hats, sat in the sun, did subsistence farming. That was a threat to the system. So what happened was they needed the labor because they found gold and they needed people to go down the mines. So all they did was just force black people off the land and into the mines. And the way you do it is easy. You just do dog taxes and poll taxes and roof taxes. And you just force people back into the system. And that's what they'll do. You, you see with Alice and McDowell stuff is they'll get you from the kids. You know, you if you have kids, they will have a million things that you have to comply with. And to do that will imply vaccinations, uh, conformance with all these, you know, things like having a cell phone on. You have your digital shackles. You know, basically, you, they they will fit you into these programs. And increasingly, what's going to happen is things like UBI. Now, UBI, a lot of people, and me too, until I got wise to what was really happening, was I thought, oh, UBI is going to be great. You know, UBI comes along, we can do activism all day, and you know, this is going to be. Say, no, you won't. They'll give you a UBI, and it's all basically the, the spending is uh, – they basically do nudges. So they, they do personal um, personal improvement plans. So if you're an activist, they'll say you have a low cre social credit score, and they'll give you a right. personal actual action plan. And that'll say, well, you can uh, – you know, it'll be everything from uh, – you see, everything is included, education, health, uh, well-being and stuff. So they will say, okay, you're an activist – You've got a, a, a psychological problem, so you need to go to psychotherapy, and then you know part of your UBI will be for psychotherapeutic meds. Then you know they'll say, okay, well you've got diabetes, and you know part of your thing they'll give you a little nudge so that if you you know spend money on pizza, they, it won't be you won't be able to use your UBI to do that. You know it'll have to be healthy foods. So they control your your life in micro detail, and they do it through through um, social programs in the UBI. So the, the it's a it is a direct threat to the system if you try and drop out into a parallel polar. So I don't, there's no hope of doing that. There's zero hope of of avoiding these things. And even to the extent that some people in France tried, some anarchists tried to drop out and do a parallel, and they they flagged them instantly as eco terrorists. And the the thing that triggered 
bigger death was that they stopped using cell phones. As soon as the group stopped us using cell phones, uh, they started surveilling them intensely and infiltrating them because they, they thought, okay, now they've gone radical. So you can't, those options are not open. So, but there is an option and you've been hedging around it all the time in certain words. You say, like, we have to build cultural barriers and stuff like that. Well, yes. So, uh, hey, I want to say something, just lead in here to try and get here dramatically is in this article you you mentioned harari um this this one about the future of um basically false religion and basically how these you know transhumanists are going to try and use you know transcranial stimulation and stuff sure. as a substitute for god and religion yep. okay so so the bit the bit that i just want to read out here is is harari's thing where he says uh uh, they will spend more and more time playing virtual reality games. Uh, this is like what um, you wrote when asked about the prospect of what you, the useless class will do after robots take our jobs and they're on UBI and then control micro level. The historian you will uh, know Harari quipped, they will spend more and more time playing virtual reality games. It will give them much more excitement and emotional engagement than anything in the real world outside. You could say that for thousands of years already, millions of people have found meaning in playing virtual reality games. We just call those games religions. Okay, so here, are you ready, drum roll? Are you ready for the solution to this whole problem? The solution is, you know, an alternate reality. You're saying build a cultural barriers and say they giving us a very shitty dystopian reality. And it is an alternate reality. We just come up with another alternate reality. It's not a breakaway rea rea a reality. It's not a parallel polis where we reject their stuff. It's we embrace their stuff. We go into the matrix. We do all this digital stuff and we make them regret that we did it. <laughs> because you see, it's all a question of just getting a better narrative. So if it's an alternate reality, then you do these things called alternate reality games. So I came to this conclusion. I saw all of this coming in 2012. I stumbled on the concept, well, uh, the concept of alternate reality gaming. Have you ever heard of this concept? Um, actually, uh, before... yes, but uh, until I, I, I read uh, the first part of the document that, uh, that uh, you'd sent me, and I, I found um, I found the ideas to be extraordinarily, uh, how, how do I put it? Uh, obviously, your your creativity is is on point. The, the whole notion of creating a sort of digital egregore is uh, is, is fantastic. Uh, before I go on, I, let's just uh, I'll go ahead and say that I am extraordinarily skeptical of any resistance to technocracy that involves adopting, you know, an immersive technological. Uh, reality or, or culture. But um, at the same time, I couldn't help but be impressed with the just the absolute creativity of it all. So I, I, I can see how much of a, an artistic outlet uh, the digital medium is. And, you know, that's undeniable. Anyway, that, that's my that was my first impression. But please uh, go on. Oh, so, so all of that and the artwork and stuff is just a tool. Here's the secret that underneath it all, what you're really creating is a cult. So, you know, you say you need a, a counterculture and cultural barriers. Well, you know, it is in the word cult. That's the secret, is right? Sure. So, cult is you short know, most for people culture, get completely right? freaked out if you say cult. Yeah, it comes from the, um, the, the, Proto in the European quell, which means you know the center of a wheel, the hub of a wheel, or the center of a drain, or you know, kind of center of a black hole. It, it, it means you know, like the swirling around a drain, you know, because uh, because you, you normally have a charismatic leader, and then it draws people into his orbit, and so it's kind of like that orbital system. But and then yeah, all the, anything to do with cult is based on that that idea. So, okay, so now most people get a bit freaked out about cults. And here's the thing is, uh, A, you can have a benign cult. And B, there's a certain idea that more and more people are getting, and I'm trying to convince people of. And that's you can have a cult and you tell people it's a cult. So it kind of inoculates it. It's kind of basically saying, you know, um, 
It's kind of like having a placebo and you tell people that it's a placebo and you get this placebo effect. It's, it still works, even though, you know, it's kind of benign. So um, the idea then is uh, that you, you just build up a movement and you think later what to do with it. If, if later you want to go, you know, with Uncle Ted or whatever, but the opportunity will present itself later, particularly, you know, when the state responds. If the state does something, you know, and Charles Schwab and all of these guys do something really egregious, like, for example, they go to war or they try and do a draft or, you know, something that really outrages the public, but they're all in lockdown, then immediately you can start all of this. You can, you know, put the, the thing into action. It's, I, I struggled for many years to explain this concept to people. Um, and, but then, you know, QAnon came along and stole my thunder. They did it in two years. They stormed the Capitol <laughs> in exactly what, you know, what is you, you can do. I'm not saying you storm the Capitol, but it shows you that once you set up that uh, cult and that, that mindset uh, with a group of members, um, you know, it can become like the Falun Gong or <clears throat> it can <clears throat> spread all over the world. And you just keep on developing the mindset. So you don't debate people. You see, as a writer, you're probably thinking of, you know, opening up the debate. Well, I can tell you, no one wants to have this debate. These guys are already bored. They love this shit. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example that there's a German friend of mine is, who's got a boat here. He had a, a, a young guy from Germany, you know, kind of 15 or something that came out on his boat, had a wonderful boating experience. And he said he didn't like it. He's not going to go boating again. And the guy asked him why, and he said, well, boating's dangerous, which is true. And he says, I can, if I want to go on a boat and have a boating experience, I can do this when, uh, oh, shit, but, uh, sorry, this guy coming a bit too close to, to me. Yeah. Um, I might have to just break off and go and tell him to fuck off. Um, uh, okay, I'll just watch it. Anyway, the, um, so, so, the, the, so the guy said, look, I, I don't, like boating it's not real i can have the same experience on a boat in virtual reality and uh and no danger and so my friend was horrified he said you know <laughs> the danger is real but you're actually doing something the reward is you know if, if you sail around the world in virtual reality and you tell people i'm around the world sailor and you know microsoft sailing <laughs> or something is like you haven't done anything you haven't risked anything you haven't, but if you sail around the world on a real boat in reality well that's something and the guy couldn't get the concept of reality versus virtual reality and the safety of virtual reality. So, so you know, gen last is already last. So I think the only way you can get it then is you go into the matrix, into this virtual reality, and you bring them out. You basically say, hey, let's play a game. And they get into the game and they get loyalty to the movement. And then the movement brings them back to reality. In, in effect, we're just talking them down from a bad drug trip, if you see what I mean. Uh, the, 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 again, the concept is, is fantastic. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I, I certainly have no criticism of it, but I, I have no, you, you've experienced virtual reality, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, I hate it because it's kind of this dead, <laughs> dead shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Alternate reality, reality, which means that that you, as she was explaining, you you're bringing you're bringing people back into the real world where they interact with real humans, and in in sure, real sure. in real outdoor settings, even in nature, uh, you know, it's not something that is something to to, to to as Hugh was saying, it's like taking a drug addict off his drug. Right. Yeah, going into the, uh, you're kind of going in and putting the needle to your arm to, to show that you're, 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 you're cool and then pulling them back. No, I, I get it. No, it's actually, it's a, again, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic and utterly, you know, uh, it's, it's a wild concept, right? So for me, I, you know, I, I don't plan on spending any more time on a computer than I absolutely have to, which at the moment, uh, given my position is, is quite a bit, but that's certainly not the long-term plan for you. I, I I'm all about it, man. Go get them. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded, I, I'm reminded of, uh, though, like uh, Gab for instance, right. Or, 
uh, these sorts of uh, alternative platforms that, uh, you know, if you've ever spent any time on Gab, you know that there's a lot of really intelligent people on there. There's a, a lot of interesting conversations, but it, it, because it's unregulated, and especially because it attracts uh, the sort of dissident mindset, it's um, just a, a web work of, of, of lunacy as well, right? Like it's, it's both. Not that Twitter is necessarily that much better, but it's just say that the more unhinged personalities tend towards Gab than these alternative platforms. In, in the same way, um, I, I question how much impact that's having on the larger system. I mean, it, it's, it's creating an alternative system to what Twitter and the kind of hegemony of, of, of the Silicon Valley types have created. It's, it's definitely created an alternative. I'm not convinced, though, that it won't fall into all the same traps uh, that the original models that these alternative platforms are intending to rebel against, that they won't just become an alternate reality version of that same thing. Now, you know, you've only just uh, yeah, introduced this concept to me, and I, and, I, and I certainly am not trying to say that uh, I'm not trying to critique your idea on that. Uh, but I am I am reminded of that, that, uh, you know, these, these ideas of creating um, alternatives that, that closely mirror the system that you're trying to rebel against, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't ever seem to work out well in the end. At the same time, though, I mean, you know what you're talking about. Uh, it, it, it does um, it does intrigue me this notion of going into uh, the gaming industry, so to speak, or the the, the, the gaming world, creating a, a universe. Oh, no, 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 wait, this is, that's huh. common mistake. Common mistake. Okay. Okay. This is not about gaming. This is not a lot about online gaming. Okay, people get confused because occasionally ARGs do an online game. But they just what's called rabbit holes, uh, I mean, or trailheads um, uh, or rabbit holes. And they, they just uh, trailheads to lead people into the game. So it's basically just a way of going and getting tech heads and stuff. So you do a game, but it generally leads into the real world. And that's what the, the ARG is about, is re leading people into the real world with flesh and blood people and real trees and real forests and real growing programs and stuff. But you see, you do it in the on the basis of it's um, it's a scavenger hunt and it's a treasure hunt and stuff like that. So the main it also the it also sounds like uh, the merry pranksters to me a lot. Yeah. So the the guys that really really understand this are the, the guys that I mentioned in that doc, the the institute and um, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, Jeff Hull, Spencer McCall. We just did. Um, an interview with Spencer McCall yesterday, and it was, it was, um, I really like talking to those guys. They just did this thing called In Bright Axiom and the Latitude Society. And the Latitude Society is a cult that's not a cult. They completely get the idea. And, and they're doing, you know, I got the idea, this idea f f that I'm talking about from them. So it, it's, um, it's, it is designed to, so you go to Mendocino and you go, and meet real people around a campfire and you it's a <clears throat> it's a cover for getting back to the real world without you know but, but you have all these trailheads in the blog space in the online space but i mean i hate being online i hate social media and i would i would love to get away from it but i have no illusions that you can't just drop out and you know, do a vegetable garden, <laughs> otherwise they'll come and get you. I mean, I'm on a boat and stuff, and I, I, I hang, hang, on hang, hang, hang on a second. Hang on a second. I know lots of people who have dropped out and grown vegetable gardens, and so far as I know, they're not under surveillance by any uh, intelligence agencies or any other authorities. I, I, I'm, I'm not curious. Yet. Not yet. It's coming. Uh, it's it's coming. Yeah, you see, this is why you must have a look at Alison McDowell and stuff. You see, there's so few people that really get it, what's coming. This, uh, why? I mean, why listen, so listen, I'm completely, like, I, I, I've, cer I've certainly yeah. fantasized and uh, terrified myself with the concept, and I'm under no illusions that it's not possible. Uh, but I guess what I'm saying is that it's certainly not the case at the moment. I mean, I, there are tons and tons of people who are choosing to opt out. Not as many as I would like, 
Uh, and certainly they're not as closely allied with each other and they don't necessarily see themselves as part of a resistance so much as the, just making personal choices. Uh, but yeah, I mean, going off the yeah, grid, that's, whole, an Ameri- a- that's an American tradition, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you see, the, it's days ending. See, for, for, uh, there's a, the whole eco movement and the eco village movement and stuff, and everybody mm-hmm. goes and do, does these, you know, kind of training for an eco village and stuff. It was, it was all a scam. It was all a commercial scam. I, I know I, uh, I have a friend who's, who was a director of one of these big things in Ecuador, and they get all the kids and they teach them how to do sustainable living and stuff. And, it's all horseshit, right. basically, and, and and she admitted it eventually. That saying that, it, you know, if the grid ever goes down, it's all they all they won't survive any longer than anybody else because as soon as the solar panels and the batteries run out, they they're screwed. <laughs> you Again, can't I, the look, I'm not, I'm not, I, so I'm not say, talking about. I, I, I'm not talking about people going off the grid to the point that they're living by themselves with nothing but a solar cell and a bean patch. Um, I mean, people who just simply have done and you see this all over rural America. It's it's being eroded, which is one of the reasons that I've decided to completely restructure my life around, you know, putting forward the research that I've been doing on this for you know the last two and a half decades. I, but I gotta just keep, keep, talk, keep talking. I got to go yell at these guys. Sorry, Hannah. No, I, I'll wait to get back. I'll tell you what, um, uh, if, if, I'll speak with your other guests for a while. She's quite charming. Yeah, thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, but you see, I'm a, I'm actually a dropout. I, I left the city for living on an island off off the off the coast of Ireland. And when I was young, mm. and bring up my children and grow my veg, and went back to work a little bit in the medical system, but never trusted it. So always kept growing my food. And and I've been gravitating around these eco projects of greed. And I know a lot of those things. I've been to a lot of. And at the end of the day, I, I have been woken up to the to the true reality that, uh, as Hugh was saying, they are extremely vulnerable because I started yes. to take and I started to see that in, in, in a case of war, in a case of and which is one of the scenarios that could happen uh, very sure, certainly there's a good prop. There's a good probability for that. But all, all sorts of other scenarios. All those off grids, all those people who want to live like that, are going to be are going to be uh, their, their existence is going to be compromised anyway. So, I don't think it is a long term way of of activism. And I returned to another type. Well, I'm exploring other other options, even though I'm still growing my veg. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. So so any, anyway, the the counterculture movement and and you know is just repeating history so it, it really makes me want to slip my wrists all these people just repeating in a, a very milk toast and watered down way what happened in the 70s so there's a great thing about um uh adam curtis if you've ever seen him he's a you know documentary maker from the bbc and he he he's very insightful and he covered all of this and is he the and one that the did that movie uh, hyper, and hyper and normalization yeah, yeah, in yeah, that's, yeah no, exactly. He's, he's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and he, and he had the geodesic domes, and you know Buckminster Fuller, and everybody went, you know, did Buckminster Fuller, and it all turned to crap. And he goes over the same ideals. So it's like when I see these guys, you know, recreating all of this and saying, "Oh, we're going to drop out," and say, "Hey, you're not going to drop out." B Climate change is going to get you and see everybody's done it before and all they do is they recreate the same old shit. So it's it's like it's it's absolutely doomed. Everybody's done has been they're just regurgitating something out of ignorance that didn't work in the 70s. So it's like sure. a, I, I think as part of the thing is we need to wean people off this idea is that, you know, we're all in now. Basically, there's no escape. There's no damned escape from this. This thing is all encompassing. What these guys intend to do with the micromanagement of us and kind of like everything is like e-education, you know, e-social philanthropy, e-everything. And that, that e implies that we, you know, e-currency and stuff means that we will be controlled to, you know, like little toddlers. In fact, we'll be regimented like we, we're in an army. So this won't be an option. So uh, to the extent that that is certainly uh at least implicit 
in a lot of the discussions and writings that come out of uh, the World Economic Forum and, and a lot of the, especially the, the, the leaked or unintentionally uh, released documents that come out of Silicon Valley. Uh, but one of the more gripping, right, was the selfish ledger. I mean, it wasn't an official document, but I think it really encapsulated the way in which a digital technocracy fits into the concept of cultural evolution as a, as a validation for its existence, as being some sort of higher being that we should all aspire to. Anyway, uh, as you read it, you do see this totalitarian edge. I don't think anybody at the World Economic Forum has said we seek to dominate the planet with our, with our ideas, though they do edge pretty close to it. But it's implicit in a lot of their ideas. There's this universalist, this kind of universalist impulse in their ideas. But, you know, they haven't been able to realize it yet. Uh, it's not even close to the level of cohesion and totality that they seem to intend, or at least I suspect that they intend. Um, so the, the nightmarish dystopic doomsday scenario is one uh, that you know, my imagination tends towards, but my imagination is, is going to uh, pan out as, as, as it's envisioned in my mind, right? It, it almost never does. I'm surprised constantly. So whatever my projections for the future are, I trust them to the extent that I trust that I know what's going to be around the next bend in the road, uh, especially if I don't know where I'm going. Uh, that it's not going, that the road's not going to drop off in front of me. But, uh, you know, these dystopic imaginations of the future, uh, I, I, I simply, uh, by and large, I embrace them and am skeptical of them simultaneously, and probably for that reason, right? Because I tend towards a sort of uh, dystopic, paranoid sort of mentality. Yeah, I was raised in the South in the middle of nowhere. It's just how we are. But uh, I also understand that it, it, it can be of great value. I, I, I haven't let it go. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily represent reality as it is in its totality. And it certainly doesn't represent reality as it's going to be in its totality. You don't have to go very far outside of your boat. And I'm sure um, you wouldn't have to go too far outside of your garden around the islands and uh, the islands of Ireland uh, to find all sorts of people out in nature doing what is natural to human beings. People have not stopped doing that. Right. That's, that's something that I constantly remind myself, <clears throat> no matter how grim this sort of technocratic imagery is that's coming out of Silicon Valley, that's coming out of the CCP, that's coming out of the World Economic Forum. No matter how grim that is, I don't think most people live that way yet. And I certainly don't think most people want to live that way. And so uh, yeah, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm simply not so dismal. I think this was definitely smart to prepare for the worst because the worst tends to come around the corner pretty frequently. But I, I, I certainly haven't lost hope to the point that... Uh, that, you know, for instance, that uh, even just the notion of sabotage, aside from its unrealistic premises, uh, that that's even a desire. It, it, there's not this machine represents as the people who constructed it say that it, it does. This machine represents the culmination of generations. Uh, you could argue millennia of dreams that human beings have had to elevate themselves to godhood and to control themselves, to control society, and to control the environment. This is nothing new. It's the, the rapidity of the technological element that's new. And it's completely disorienting. And it's absolutely terrifying as to what could happen, just like it was terrifying in the 50s and 60s as to what could happen if nuclear war broke out. But in the same way that nuclear war hasn't yet broken out, not to say that it won't, but we have literally spent... There, you know, there's there, there are decades of people before me, before I was born, who lived under the constant specter of nuclear war. And they watched the Twilight Zone and they went through the drills and they 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 knew that there was a fallout shelter below their their school. It didn't happen. And it didn't happen because that specter was held above the public imagination to the point that 
not only the public, but the leaders who are in charge of these weapon systems have thus far chosen not to rain that terror down upon us. Now, you take that and you compare it to these technocratic dreams of absolute control and total digitalization of every, every element of human life and perhaps even of natural life. I think that the reason it's gotten so much traction at present is just simply that people are not aware of how possible it is and they're not aware of how detached the people who plan on implementing these things are from the regular populace. I am fairly certain that if the public was aware of this, there would be massive outrage. And I'm pretty hopeful that to the extent that the public can be made aware of these plans that are being made for us, that it won't necessarily require any sort of violent uprising or any other shit like that. It, 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 it rarely, rarely have social movements succeeded in that regard, at least long term. Um, they always tend to become the thing that they are, they're fighting against. Again, I, I'm, I'm not yeah, yeah. saying that in regards yeah, to uh, the alternate reality gaming. I, I'm still actually quite enamored with the notion. Uh, but uh, the elephant in the room is the environment. Right. So just one thing. Sorry, but I mean, uh, if you want to yeah, bring just, it. Just, may, may I? Yeah, may I? So, so just to respond to you, yeah, I think I agree yeah, totally with what you're saying um in terms of how bad it can get it's it can't get you know the way i imagine it is kind of like it can't get any worse than china is today um so i don't think or you know certainly no worse than like north korea but it's probably some you know if we go to war or something like that it would be somewhere like uh, the stasi and east germany but the the i think where you're wrong is that people will want it. You see, like if you look in China today, people actually like social credit scoring. People, I think it'll be 50-50 and, the, and they're kind of planned it that way. So that the, the vast majority of people want to be sheep. They, they want to be regimented. They, they, they like the fact that they don't have to think. And it's, it's like being in the army. Most people in the army, as I discovered, was they they like the fact that everything's clearly clear cut the deal is simple you just obey the rules do your job and you get fed they right. all know that you know you might have get sent over the top to be cannon fodder one day but it's a very distant reality and on the whole you, it's very clearly defined what the rules are the barriers and it's very easy to conform to them and then it's great you don't have to make any choices you don't get any anxiety about making decisions you have them done for you and you trust that the commanders will basically make the right decisions and then most people will go for that deal the reason why it doesn't work now is because of the macro picture so one of the things that's implied in in the great reset is they're preparing for climate change. That's it's not really explicit in what they do. They mention it now and again, but the, the climate change is a lot I more. I would say that, you know the, the World Economic Europe. Forum in general, like the, the, the central thrust of, of most of their publications at this point, uh, is in some way related to climate change. So I would say it's very explicit. Oh yeah, okay, but but they're not sharing the details. That they're not sharing how imminent it is, and they're not sharing the catastrophic climate change. They still. Uh, perpetuating this kind of myth that it's it's gradual and you know we could always turn it back there's no and they never mention tipping points or how close we are to them they never mention all these catastrophic things that uh, just don't fit with this nice smooth narrative so it's all like you know nice smooth graphs and you extrapolate the graph forward there's no, no nothing uh, systemic social or or technological well there's a technological tipping point yeah they, they talk about that a lot but uh, the the thing about uh, what's implied and they're not really fessing up to is geoengineering. Now, the way I see it is what's very likely to happen is they will implement geoengineering and it will work. And that will be the problem because it's hubris squared. It's kind of an all in bet on us managing the weather. And I think the worst thing you could possibly do for us is to give a uh, you know all the global leaders of thermo uh, global thermostats that they can fight over. So it's very, it's very soon you'll get from saving the planet to having well enhancing, say, crop production or something like that. But what they're going to do if they if geoengineering, geoengineering works is they're going to take 
any caps off greenhouse gas emissions or any kind of uh, caps on growth. And then, so when they screw it up and geoengineering doesn't, you know, they can't do it for some reason, like they're having a war or they're busy or they have an economic collapse or some reason why they can't do it for a month or two, then the effect of like 1,800 parts per million CO2 is going to basically devastate us. So you can see it's basically Icarus flying too close to the sun. And yes, I sure. think that the worst thing in the world, it's control of everything. And if you give them control of the weather, I think we're, we're screwed. And so, so it's very insidious because most people are going to like it. They're going to welcome it. So if that's the case, um, if, if you're correct and that, you know, most people are sheep, which is, you know, it doesn't take many trips around the block to uh, find some evidence for that, though I don't necessarily believe that that's the case. But if it's true that most people want technocracy, that most people want communism, that most people want uh, predatory capitalism, whatever the, the totalizing system may be. Uh, you know, I don't really see much else that can be done. If that's what most people want, and I don't want it, uh, I'm not going to impose my desire on them, right? Like, I, the, the, the whole problem that I have with the system as it exists at present is that the desires of a small number of people are being imposed on me and many others like me who have no desire to take part in it. Uh, the only thing I want to do, I don't want to stop these techno innovators from trying to create God in a computer. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think that they're going to keep trying. And I, I think that it, they'll produce something like a God-like machine I don't think that it will be worth listening to on every problem. And I think that's probably the biggest problem is that people already rely on artificial intelligence algorithms to make critical decisions that would be better done by human beings. Uh, but all in all, what I'm saying is that these trends are happening uh, on the force of centuries of, of cultural evolution. And they're not going to stop because I'm waving a sign saying I don't like robots. I'm tempted to do so, uh, but it's, it, it's no better than, than Alex Jones screaming at a bullhorn at the Bilderbergers. May, may, I, I, do, may I? When you oh, yes, please. Sorry. Well, I, I guess ultimately what I mean to say is that it's, it's an enormous world with plenty of room for plenty of types of people. Uh, the biggest problem that people have is that when different types of cultures butt up against each other, there's a tremendous amount of friction. And especially when one culture is far more powerful than the other and begins to impose itself on the other culture, Native Americans being a prime example. Uh, I don't want to end up like the Native Americans, but those motherfuckers fought tooth and nail to the end and look where it got them. So whatever solution there is to the present technocratic trends coming out of the most elite institutions in the West and also in China and Japan. Um, I don't think it's going to involve taking up arms. I don't think it's necessarily going to involve making a lot of noise like the 60s radicals did with their protest movements. Um, I, I certainly don't have a clear image of the solution at, at present, or at least the clear images I have, I don't have enough confidence in to argue for. Um, but I, I do think that, as you say, if people want this, if people want to become cyborgs, if this is the life they want to lead, there's really not much to do but try to escape or just grit, you know, grit your teeth and bear it because that's what's going to happen. That's the reality. I don't think it's a necessary reality. I don't necessarily think that's what's going to happen, but if it's true that people desire this en masse, then that's just the way it is. I hold out the dream that that well, So I disagree, but, uh, 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 but uh, before I, just, I speak, then let's uh, speak. Uh, just, just very yeah, sorry. But you mentioned, no, Derek, you mentioned Derek Jensen earlier. We, we've been talking to him for a while, and Hugh has interviewed him a couple of years ago too, and we follow Deep Green Resistance and what they do quite a lot. And you see, he said one day that he... He's, he pledged his allegiance to the natural world against the system. 
And I think we're a little bit in that place. Our, our group is mostly, we're all <laughs> environmentalist in a in a special way, not maybe not what you would imagine, but the the and, and everything that you're talking about, presuming that people can live up in a parallel world and continue to grow their veg and be live close to nature, you presume you presume that the climate and that and that nature will be intact, will be able to right. provide. But we're in an emergency there that is maybe not going to. Um, enable that to happen. So that's why we're, that's, that's where we are, where Derek is saying, well, F the system first, nature first, and humans first also, but not, you know, that that's where I, you, 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 Hugh would, would express it much better than me. No, I, 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 really, no, I do hear what you're saying. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, it's a beautiful sentiment. I mean, I, my respect for, for Jensen's work is very high, even if I think that not unlike the Marxist, his conclusions are perhaps uh, misguided or at, at least uh, they're not going to succeed. But, you know, I, it doesn't change the fact that his critique of the system uh, is brilliant. And I think his passion for nature and his knowledge of the natural world really comes out in his writing in a beautiful way. So, uh I, you know, I, it, my disagreement with his conclusions, his sort of radical conclusions, doesn't preclude my appreciation for his work. But because of my disagreement with those radical conclusions, and, and in particular, uh, I, I, my skepticism uh, as to whether or not large swaths of the natural world will survive uh, the, the coming centuries of, of, of impacts and degradation, uh, also keeps me from, I guess, taking that radical point of view. Uh, doomsday say you know doomsday scenarios are as commonplace as uh, dreams of gods right it, it, it's it's always been so um, not and mainly because doomsday is possible it's happened continuously throughout the earth's history right I mean you look through the fossil record and you see massive extinction extinction events you look at the present climate you see you see the the, the, the climatic shifts, the explanations in my mind are uh, still up for debate, but undoubtedly habitat loss, extinction of animals, that is occurring at a rapid clip. And to the extent that that can be stopped, Godspeed to you all. But on the whole, the idea that the earth is destined to become some barren dune-like wasteland uh, in the near future is possible. Uh, you know, it's possible that dragons will emerge from the sea. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know whether it will happen. The indications Meet are dragons. In fact, they could emerge from the sea very shortly. In fact, um, but you but I, I, I dragon. In fact. No, no, I'm sorry, I, I I missed the first part of the what. You said dragons could emerge from the sea. I say, oh, the methane, methane, very methane, 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 methane dragon. dragon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, 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 you know, all really, all you know, with uh, uh, gene editing being what it is, uh, it, it may not be that long before dragons emerge from the sea. But I guess uh, you know, to me, uh, any culture that rides on a on a very strong kind of doomsday scenario is destined, unless that doomsday is in fact imminent, which they tend not to be. Um, any culture that rides on a doomsday scenario is bound to make radical missteps. Uh, I grew up in a culture which foresaw imminent planetary doom, right? You know, Southern Baptist culture, pre-millennium, uh, you know, the, the, the signs were in the sky. It was clear what was happening to everybody around me, right? Uh, now, I didn't buy into it wholeheartedly as I grew older anyway. As a kid, obviously, you just believe what you're told. Um, but, you know, as I became a teenager, I doubted it very much. But that sort of imagery has seeped into me just like it seeped into countless hundreds of millions or billions of people all over the planet, right? It's not an unhealthy idea to think that human beings or, you know, natural forces or the gods even uh, could completely come in, come in and destroy everything and fuck everything up. It could happen. And anything that we can do to avoid that is, is, is positive. But the cultures that I grew up in were so deluded degradation when it, when it culminates in this doomsday scenario, I immediately recoil 
I suppose. Uh, you know, the, 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 the great freeze was supposed to have occurred, uh, you know, according to the predictions of the 60s. And obviously that didn't pan out. Well, these sorts of things, these big picture sorts of scenarios uh, don't really, e even if they appeal to my imagination, they, they don't appeal to my intellect because I've seen how fucking idiotic the decisions that are made on the basis of imminent doom can be. Another instance, if I could add, are you familiar with oh, a, yeah. a small cult yeah. uh, called uh, Zendik Farm? Have you ever heard of them? No. So Zendik no, Farm was one of me. They're not quite as famous as The Farm. You're familiar with The Farm in Middle Tennessee? Yeah, yeah, The Farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so they were formed in around... Yeah, so the Zendik Farm was formed around the same time, far more radical than The Farm. Uh, you know, they, they you know, they, they, they skirted just to the edge of eco-terrorist sort of rhetoric, but they never crossed over really, or, or, or maybe they did and I just chose not to uh, hear it. But I went and lived with him for quite some time. Uh, when, I, when I first, you know, reached adulthood, I, I hitchhiked down and um, stayed on this commune. And um, it, it was probably next to growing up around anarchic rednecks, uh, probably the most eye-opening experience of my life. It's, it's never really, it's never left me uh, because they were absolutely right in their conclusion that the broad mainstream American culture is utterly unhealthy. And they were absolutely right that new ways of life have to be arrived at in order to survive all of the negative impacts of this broad uh, sort of herd-like culture. Uh, but, you know, on everything else, including their predictions of, of imminent doom, including their idea that, uh, let's just say, the immune system is always going to be strong enough to take care of STDs, um, including the idea that uh, their leader uh, had all the answers, no matter what, again, fucking idiotic. It just didn't pan out. They, they you know, they got a ton of pussy and dick. Um, they built super cool buildings. Uh, they grew really tasty vegetables, um, but eventually they had to disband as after the leaders died. And, uh, you know, their dreams of they literally had these insane, you know, egomaniacal ideas. that They were going to be able to to reach the pinnacle of power and change the world through sort of aggressive measures, whatever uh, the sorts of fantasies that a lot of LSD will tend to induce. Um, but, you know, it, it never fucking happened. Right. And And. So many things never fucking happened. The Capitol riots occurred because they thought that the army would swoop in and take care of all of the evil people uh, who, who do exist to some extent, um, and, and, and the swarm, clear the way for the yeah, yeah, and clear the way for uh, you know a, a, a society of freedom. Well, instead of that happening, now people like me are seen apparently as fucking potential. You know, whatever. Well, we won't even use the word at least in this context. Um, and th there are a ton of people in fucking prison and they may not be out for decades. And you know, did it, did it have a positive impact? I, I don't know. You know, maybe later historians will look back on that moment and say, yeah, that really worked out for the best. Ultimately, the, the sort of cultural dominoes fell in the, in the favor of those who, who set that in motion. Uh, but again, whenever uh, doomsday scenarios are invoked as a justification for action, in my experience and in my research, it, it doesn't seem to work out too hot. That's my take on that. Uh, yeah, so no, it doesn't. But here, the, they're necessary for a cult. So if a Southern Baptist ideology, it comes from basic Christianity, and Christianity's roots are a doomsday cult. Je Jesus sure. was a doomsday prophet. And so sure. uh, you, you can't really do a cult as far as I know without saying that you, you know, it, it has to be kind of binary. You have to say life is at stake. And, you know, if we don't act doom. And so everybody is forced into that. A cult has to say that. So it's just a device, right? You, I mean, you, you see the, the thing is you can't take it too intellectually. It's, it's not highbrow. You're trying to get people viscerally. So the whole point is that you know, we're trying to head off. We, we have a goal, and that's to like head off transhumanism and all these guys. So, so the thing that I don't agree with you is that we can't do anything about it. If people want to be cyborgs and transhumans, then we can't do anything. I say, no, 
especially as a writer, you've got a tremendous thing to offer because what people are people are being taken for a ride based on a narrative. And so the transhuman and technocratic narrative is that we have the singularity of the nerds and we have the rapture of the nerds and soon AI fixes all our problems. It's, it's all batshit crazy. It's mad as it's as mad as anything you can come up with in any it cult is. you've had. It is a cult. I would agree. So so you just do a counter cult. You do a counter culture counter cult. And so so uh, you just have a different narrative. Now it's very easy for us because we're all about team human. We're saying we're protecting life and humanity. And these guys are necromancers. They want death. Machines are dead. Virtual worlds are dead. E-currencies, E-everything is dead. It's boring. It's like a mausoleum. It's predictable. It's just tedium. So they haven't got a good story. It's like, oh, once you've got over your 12-year-old Star Trek fantasy, then you say, well, space is as boring as all fuck. No one wants to live on Mars. You know, you know, you're gonna go, you follow Elon Musk to Mars and stuff. You know how shit it is. If you didn't like lockdown, we'll try having lockdown in a barrel on a hyperbaric barrel with like, you know, two feet of lead to protect you from solar flares. It is not Mars is not a fucking fun place. So stop jerking off you know, Elon Musk goes, you know, SpaceX and stuff. It's like, yeah, it's all great with the blast off, and then they drop you on Mars. Bye. Have a nice time. Enjoy your video games. But that's you living in a <laughs> you living in a hyperbaric chamber. You might as well be under the sea. And, and so it's yeah. the reality sucks balls. And so it's it's just so damned easy for us to say we we're all about unpredictability. We're all about chaos, and they're all about order, regimentation, predictability. The 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 sterile world is you know where no one gets sick and stuff. It's like. I would even have my kids get sick if it means that, well, they still have an exciting life. They have risk. They have possibility. They have things that they can't expect. And they have romance and adventure and stuff that, right. you know. So it's exactly the thing that you know is you say, you're saying, look, we're heading for an apocalypse if we go that way. But the other way is unknown adventure and stuff. And we absolutely win the narrative. It's just so damned attractive, right? So you just basically build a secret society. You, you basically raid all the things that, uh, you know, the uh, psychology, uh, psychology that is the psychology of a psyops. And so, you know, that's all we're doing. We, we're not really uh, going Uncle Ted or anything. It might turn that way, but you always have the option. Hey, don't, I, people I, are so I, I, into a I don't, I don't. I don't want to know a fucking thing about it if you guys are going to go, Ted. Uh, delete, delete, delete. Well, well, nobody, delete. nobody would. Nobody, nobody plans to go, Uncle Ted. You see, where, where you, where that would happen is if things go badly wrong. You see, if if things went into some really let, dark. Let, let, me, let me ask you something. Actually, two things. One, my my battery is about to go dead. Uh, as you know, uh, is it, so I'm going to either have to work out that technical issue real quick uh, or, or cut it short. Now, we'll have to cut it off, but let me ask you something real quick. Are you guys talking about Uncle Ted shit on YouTube? Because that's a really, really bad fucking idea. I, we just talk about it in a very elliptical way. So no more than GDR and, and Eric Jensen and those two. So we, we basically our security culture is, is that you, you have to, whatever you say, you have to, whatever you write or whatever you say, it must be publishable. There must be no secrets and stuff. So what it, I, whatever I write, I, I make sure that I'm, I would be happy to have it read back to me by a prosecuting attorney on the stand. So, okay. You know, just, just, so, so Fair I, enough, if, it, you know, I would be quite happy if a jury saw this video. Yeah. If, if a jury saw this video, if I was being prosecuted in some dystopian future for some, some hellish uh, crime that they did in retrospect or something is, is like, I'd be quite happy for this to be. Um, and everything we do is that way. Yeah. So, so give me just, give me just one moment. Uh, I'm going to uh, work out this power issue and I'll be right back. Okay. Should we wait or should we do another one? Oh, okay. So, I think he said he's oh, anyway. coming. So, right. so anyway, like, yeah, and I mean, 
Oh, that's right quick. Wow. <laughs> wow, that was quick. Uh, oh, okay, so, uh, so basically, yeah, so now if the band just plays up, do, does the band want to come in or should we go to commercial break? What should we do now? <laughs> commercial break. Let's go to commercial break. Do, do, do you want to do Steve Bannon? You can do an impression of Steve Bannon, basically recruiting for q &A. No, you do it. Sophie? No, no, you. <laughs> and Steve Bannon job. impression? I can't do a Steve Bannon impression. Next time Jesus, I have my new job. Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon. Yeah. God, I can do a Mr. Bean I mean, impression. I can, I can hear a lot of noise behind Joe. Is it? Is he in a van or something? Because he can hear traffic or something. It looks like he's in a. Are yeah, you in a yeah. Van? yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Signal, signal, not noise. Signal, not noise. That's that's Steve Bannon. By the way, <laughs> Steve Bannon is a fucking hero. I don't care what anybody says. Hey, uh, you can't say that on our neck of the woods. We we have a left wing audience. But, but anyway, the whole thing. Like, you, know like, like, you know, as far as that goes, um, you know, I've seen Steve Bannon reach out to people like Tim Pool. Um, I've, Steve, I've seen Steve Bannon uh, uh, reach out, like, obviously, like reached out in a, a huge way with Errol Morris. Uh, I've seen Steve Bannon interviewed with uh, Lester Holt. Um, I see Steve Bannon bringing on Naomi Wolf, uh, who is still. You might want to cut this, but she's still gorgeous, man. I think she's married, so I think she's already occupied. But um, at any rate, uh, I'm not just saying this uh, because of a, uh, a contractual obligation. But that guy is fucking completely open-minded compared to almost anybody, any other personality, uh, you know, who claims to be about, you know, going across the aisle and all that sort of shit. So, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, but, no, I'm, but Eddie, I'm still don't you see a movement? Don't, don't you see a change? More and more people are going across the aisle. If you see like Jordan Peterson and stuff, he's been talking to yeah. Stephen Fry and all these, and and we've been doing it too. We were talking to, to a guy. I can't say his name because it will get uh, it'll get dinged. I got a ban from from YouTube. <laughs> I'm still in he's touch doing with that him. Interview. I'm still in touch with him. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, the uh, he he's he's in this uh, movement called Drastic, and it was Drastic that broke uh, all the story that, that led to the Wuhan lad leak and Senator Ron Paul and stuff. As the Rand Paul and the you know those those hearings that are going on now, they came from him. So while we were talking on a weekly basis to him, he suddenly shot into the limelight and got famous, and so it was an amazing kind of journey. But but it was I have to say it's really difficult to talk to, to to guys on the far right and we have been but the I'll tell you what the stumbling block is is um, is religion well it's stumbling block for me is is they they all the way perfect down the line you know great reset full marks get, get it often gets a little rocky around climate change and then they know often climate denies and and then so on the left climate denial is absolutely you know religion I mean climate crisis is for truth uh but but then then you get to this thing is it's they they against transhumanism because they're christians and i'm like oh do you have to do that <laughs> it's like oh just so close you know <laughs> it's like why did you why well did you i mean look it? man yeah, um, it's, it's you, funny you, you, the spiritual thing stuff but but christian i mean you know the spirituality and team human and all of that it's fine but just you know, we 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 need to stop class swab for Jesus. It's like, oh no, you know, you you're just sounding coherent, and then yeah, you, look, these are these are ancient you just kind of like skid it off, like you lose everybody. These these are ancient anchors, right? Like they're they're not going away. Uh, I, I I don't think. I mean, I think that that's actually. I I would argue that the sort of psychological stability, and by psychological stability, I mean cultural stability over time that uh, Christianity, especially, I almost said it especially, especially Judaism, um, Hinduism, uh, you know, uh, to some extent, the, the more uh, shamanistic sort of tribal uh, religious uh, cultures that are very, very widespread and say Shinto, 
Um, these are extraordinarily ancient and durable ways of thinking of the world. Now, do they reflect accurately the, the metaphysical reality of the world? I mean, we could debate that all day. We could pick or choose. We could put them against each other, whatever. What it, I, I think is fairly undebatable is that these ancient anchors that have held down human societies and cultural norms uh, and have you know mediated our interaction with the natural world and with each other, uh, they're not going anywhere. Um, and and I, I don't think that they necessarily should. I, you know, I, I get all kinds of uh, flack from Christians all the time from all sorts of different branches, all of whom are pissed off that I don't fit into their particular model, metaphysical model of what the world should look like, what morality should look like, and even like what the fucking words I say should, should sound like. But, and it, you know, the, the idea of them scooping me up and, and burning me at the stake one day is, you know, crossed my mind more than once. Uh, but as opposed to what, right? Like you show up at, a, you know, at a Native American gathering and you, you touch the wrong piece of the end of the corn and the next thing you know, they fucking scalp you. I mean, th there is no culture that doesn't have some sense of the sacred that once it's trampled on, you're now a heretic and you're, you're, you're fair game. So as bad as that sucks, being, you know, uh, an advanced primate on planet Earth, uh, I, I forgive Christians for their particularities. Yeah, no, the, you see, what I'm lamenting, I'm absolutely with you on, in, you know, just basically uh, the value of religion and stuff like that to people and the value of the institution. Um, what's, what I'm lamenting is the fact that you lose the audience. They're basically going out there to try and recruit people against this transhumanism. And then you say, why? And it's because of my little niche thing that nobody damn well cares about. And you're like, no, no, the hang on. And it's like, you know, can't you just say, are oh, we doing it because people need to be spiritual and it's a human thing. You know, for example, I have Christianity and other people need their religions respected and transhumanisms don't respect spirit. That would be fine. But it's not. It's for Jesus. <laughs> and you know, it's like, wow, why bring Jesus into it? You know, look, I, I myself, uh, while I certainly wouldn't consider myself to be an Orthodox Christian uh, in any sense, I do spend a lot of time in Orthodox churches and in Catholic churches. And while obviously I'm not uh, consecrated enough to, uh, you know, approach the altar, so to speak, uh, I, I it's impossible for me to get around the sort of health, and by health, I mean, in a very natural sense, the health of these communities. And uh, and again, you know, Jesus is the icon that I hold in my head and heart as the highest icon, kind of a henotheistic thing for, for my own reasons. But as a kind of uh, hippy-dippy sort of individual, ultimately, uh, it doesn't preclude, uh, you know, Buddha, or even to some extent, um, you know, say, uh, you know, maybe I'm going to, out on a limb here, but say somebody like Marx. I mean, Marx had his passion. He had his points. Uh, certainly Darwin. I mean, uh, you know, Jesus does not preclude uh, Darwin's observations, at least for me. Um, but anyway, yeah, I know I hear you, man. Any, any kind of closed-minded circuit or any kind of uh, – you know, you know the, the, this limited mentality uh, and, and limited justifications for any kind of worldly action. It, you know, it gets on your nerves. But you've been around the world. You're around the world now. I mean, like, it, like all you know, the, the yeah. world is full of fucking wild beliefs that people are constantly trying to push. So yeah. it, take, it well, takes well, all that's kinds. The, that's the insight. Yeah, well, but that's the insight. Is it takes all kinds, and basically, it's we need the diversity and. Coming to Greece, I really saw a different uh, aspect to religion because I started to see the aspects of social cohesion and stuff. So I, I kind of like the Greek Orthodox Church because the Greeks are pagan. They're pagan as all hell. This Christianity is it, it's it's a very glistening veneer, but it's a very thin veneer. And you you know you just scratch the surface and you find they all like Hellenistic pagans underneath. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's the it's same in Ireland. It's like, oh, it's all fierce Catholicism like, yeah, and stuff. It's the thing, and the they all bloody the pagan, right? All the fairies, all the all the holy places, all the sacred 
circles, trees, and bushes, and it's it's yeah, it's ninety percent vegan. We're still all there's still people going to yeah, the well. It's the same in Greece. Well. It's, it's 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 evil eyes and spirits and everybody you know everything every damn altar is has got a pagan thing. So so you'll have a little altar at the side of the road and a little shrine and there's you know. And there's some somebody in an insane what's them call it or whatever, and it's all, yeah. but it's all hiding a pagan thing that's you know three thousand years old, and it's just like okay, to satisfy the church, we'll put a candle in front of it. <laughs> but but I can I can see the value because it's the cohesion, the meaning to life, the or you know Greek wedding is filled with these superstitions and shit that. But it binds the people. They have, you know, I, I worry about America. But it also America. connects them to um, nature. There's, there's no social cohesion. And it's because of the liberal these democracy. Old, these old shrines and these old places that are thousands and thousands of years old that are pre-Christian are the only connection that they have with the reality of nature. Water, trees, places, rocks. They are, they are the, their reality and they've superimposed on this a, a total a religion that is coming from a book that has very little into reality it's it's a, the, the, the the pagan rites rituals and the peg, the pagan traditions and names are totally connected with our earth you see you know, um, yes and, uh, and the transhuman thing is 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 a monoculture it's basically you, you only allowed a very narrow set of ideas. The Overton window is a thin slice about this big. Everything else is canceled and banned, and it's all authoritarian. So there, there's no tolerance. There's no diversity. It, and it, it's, um, it's a monoculture that's, that's very vulnerable, even down to the genetic level. If, if you can have designer babies, you can bet everybody will have such a monoculture of designer babies they'll all be the same to the point that they all like irish potatoes and you know vulnerable to the same devastating pandemic so i think it's terribly dangerous what they're doing undoubtedly um to the extent that it can be realized i mean you know at the moment you know transhumanism is this tiny tiny ideological core with um massive cultural resonances with their ideas right i don't know that i've ever heard Klaus Schwab, for instance, or, or if, 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 if you all know Harari has said transhumanism, he's certainly never identified as a transhuman. Uh, I'm sorry, as a transhumanist. Uh, but it, it, it is it, it's amazing to me how you do have this 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 ideological core of transhumanists who have for a long time now predicted the kind of culture that we're living in now and certainly predicted the, the culture that we're hurtling towards. Um, but yet it's not, it's sort of like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, like a, a psychedelic culture, right? Like how many hippies in the sixties wore tie dye? How many of them dropped acid every day? Undoubtedly, the reason people wore tie dye is because a lot of people on acid thought it looked cool and trippy to their, their visual effects. Uh, I but I don't know. Well, who's this? Was that you? It's Mike. Mike. Sorry about that. Maybe he's not excuse at work. Me. Please excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, um, at, at, at any rate, Sophie, uh, you know, your, your observation about the pagan connection to the natural world and uh, the tension created by the biblical narrative with that it's tragic to say the least, uh, but the notion that the Bible is just a pure fantasy, I get it, right? Um, you read Genesis, you read the miracles, all that, you know, you don't, nobody's ever seen that. So I, you know, people don't believe it, but take away the sort of, uh, literalism and look at it as a piece of literature i think that the bible has a, is, is a, a deep deep encapsulation of realities uh, ancient realities and, and still quite relevant to the present time 
maybe not for everyone. Oh yeah, uh, I don't doubt that. Yeah, you no, know, I mean it's 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 got to be one of the most important books in, in the world still. I mean, it's the biggest seller still, right? It's the best, still Is the it? biggest best seller. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Maybe the Quran is, but you see, the Islam, they have uh, quite a number of books outside the Quran and stuff. So, yeah, it's, um, no, I think it is, I mean, at least two, two billion Catholics alone. Um, and uh, I guess they all got Bibles. But no, it's still, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very important book. I mean, can, if you... If you put Origin of the Species next to the Bible, I think it's you know, Origin of the Species is sold 0.0001% of the Bible. Well, and also, the, um, if you look at the, yeah. the, uh, the, the, the concentrated wisdom in, on the Origin, it, it, it really, it, the difference is just stark, right? Uh, you know, the, the, it, it, as you read through the Bible, again, just, let's just say you ignore a literal interpretation of any of it. Let's just say that you let's just say that you go with the theory that it's all made up. Even if it is all made up, it's it's made up of extraordinarily insightful observations about human culture, even human evolution, from the, the most basic hunter-gatherer bands to the first large-scale tribes, to the first uh, you know uh, agricultural civilizations, uh, to the, the sorts of dramas of the you know empire and all of that. You're, you're talking about an extraordinarily insightful piece of literature, if nothing else. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate, I guess, uh, the number of, I guess, obnoxious Christians, we'll put it mildly, who have inoculated <laughs> so many other people to the yeah. gospel. Because uh, I, I personally find it to be, I, I think Dostoevsky called it the most beautiful story on earth, and uh, I don't think he's wrong. Yeah, well, it's it's uh, it raids psychological archetypes. So I think the story of Jesus, the reason why it's so attractive, is it's narcissistic. It's it's basically the story of every man. It's, hidden in his story is our psychological study, you struggle through life, and so it epitomizes us. So when people, you know, it it, it comes to the fore when people have a psychotic episodes and stuff, they go like, "I'm Jesus," and what they're saying is. I finally got it. I see my whole life clearly, and it is Jesus's life. It's the and you say, yeah, sure it is, because they made it that way because Jesus is the archetypal every man's life. So not surprisingly, <laughs> you're Jesus because they invented it that way. So it's it's very deep from that point of view. I think it's it's dangerous. The Old Testament is dangerous, and that you see, I think we're we're in trouble with the Old Testament and the. Reason is from Genesis, because of all this stuff about dominion over the earth and the animals and stuff. It gave us this very uh, simplistic view of the supremacy of man and basically a justification from the super being. I think that that's a big, big problematic thing there because it's, it means that we've been very bad stewards of the earth. It would be much better if they just said, you know, like, hey, you know, you, you're a chimp. You get over it. <laughs> like, you, you'll notice, though, that, 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 that you know, for instance, uh, you know, the Chinese killed off all their ele elephants very early on in their history and have created a, a, a vast monoculture of their ecological systems long before Christianity ever got there. Um, you'll also notice that, you know, in the, in the stories that at least by many people's interpretation of, say, the Anasazi Indians, uh, or uh, the Aztecs, Mayans, uh, that it didn't require the book of Genesis for the, the greed of human beings to outstrip their, their ecological environment. And, and Easter Island. And Easter Island. It's, we, we have talked about this in our group a lot. We, we, don't, we don't only identify uh, uh, the writings of any religion as the only culprit in the disconnection between man and, and nature and his, his proper place in the creation. Uh, we, we talk about another part, a part of the brain that has evolved to, to, to create this sort of behavior. But uh, there is, there is, a, there is a, a, an enormous contrast um, between the place of man in, in the Bible and the place of man in the old tales that I know of, whether mm. they are you know, of the Icelanders or of the Irish or of the old 
European tales. And the place of nature was certainly much more important. I mean, man was not disconnected, as he is in in uh, in the Bible, where he's a center figure. We could argue uh, as to how disconnected the Bible is from the natural world. Uh, no need to go that. Let's just say that, um, look at the book of Job and its descriptions of man's place in nature. If, if you if you take away the the role the the kind of cartoonish element of Yahweh in the in the story, and you look at man's place in nature according to the book of Job, I think you find something a little closer to the 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 Taoist or uh, certainly the Celtic pagan conception. It's not as literarily rich, and certainly it, it, as far as the natural world goes, it doesn't come close to Hinduism, right? I mean, you, you look at uh, the Vedas, particularly the Mahabharata, and um, you know, its descriptions of natural phenomena and the animals and, and the, the, the zoomorphism and the anthropomorphism is so uh, vivid that, you know, it's clear that these were people who had far more appreciation for nature, uh, at least in a literary sense, uh, than uh, the, the it's early not appreciation for nature that I'm talking about is human centeredness. Ah. Human centeredness. Sure. You know, and that, that is the big divide I see, you see. And I, I, look, I, I don't think I would disagree with you. I do think that there is uh, embedded in the narrative of Genesis, uh, obviously humans are at the center of all of this, right? Um, now, I would say that the Hindu mythology is the same in the sense that anthropocentrism is key. Uh, certainly Hinduism, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, certainly uh, Buddhism. I mean, you know, in, in Buddhism, the human state, even with its very elaborate mapping of the animal world and, and the, the hungry ghosts and the heavens and the hells, the human state is seen as the only possible state in which one can attain, obtain enlightenment. So it's um, this, this sort of anthropomorphism, I'm sorry, anthropocentrism is, it is a, a prominent characteristic of the Judeo-Christian narrative, but I, I think that the uniqueness of that is uh, perhaps overstated, not necessarily by you, uh, but by many critics of that narrative. At the same time, your point that the, the, the Celtic uh, European pagan tales are, are fundamentally different in the human ori in orientation of the natural environment, I would agree with you there. And I, and, I, and I think there is something dramatically healthy and realistic about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why the Vedas are the same as uh, the Mahabharata and that is the same as the religions of the book is I think they came from the same origin. They came from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. So you, you have to call them Proto-Indo-Europeans now, thank you. The sure. Nazis, but basically what they really are is well, Aryans. You just have so to... You're not allowed to call them Aryans anymore because they say... If you pronounce you it Aryan... You Indo, Indo-Iranians or any... Yeah. Any if damn you thing other than Aryans, but they don't, you know, if scholars you, jump through hoops to avoid Aryan. But they're Aryans. If, and the, the Mahabharata, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the, you know, the, the Old Testament, it's, it's from the same damn people. <laughs> it's, the, it's Aryan. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, if, you pronounce it, uh, if you pronounce it Aryan, it, um, it takes away some of the sting. Don't give it that hard A. Yeah, it's but Aryan. The trans so it is right to say that, you know, like the Armenians, that R sound is 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 what they they called themselves, and so the Armenians uh, are part of them, and that, uh, and I, I believe that that uh, even the Egyptians, the Ra, is from that R. It's actually R R. So they would say R R was the sun. And but, they, they, uh, but anyway, R is um, of noble birth, right? Of noble birth. Transhumanism has its roots in this human centeredness, and it as it roots in in those religions, it's uh, it in trans Aryan culture. In Aryan culture. It's totally irrelevant to any any uh, shamanic or any uh, nature based worship going back ten thousand years, because it wouldn't even people wouldn't even have this concept. Transhumanism is rooted in human disconnection with nature. Absolutely, and but. The reason I, 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 the I, I reason disagree, is I disagree completely. Um, I disagree completely. Look, look at the Chinese Taoist goal of creating a, an immortal being or to become an immortal being through alchemy. Uh, look at the more now again. This is this is an Indo 
uh, Iranian tradition, but look at the yogic practices and the the idea of perfecting the human physical form and then cultivating all of these magical powers. Um, all of these different cultures, yes, transhumanism, as we call it, transhumanism, right, it, as a term, comes out of the West, comes out, of, you know, I believe it was uh, Julian Huxley who coined it, but as a concept, as a broader concept, this notion that technology or human technique can protect, can perfect the human form and, and perhaps create some sort of immortal state. This is something that is, is, is drawing on all of these different ancient civilizational forms. So it's not, it, it came out of the West. It's certainly not unique to the West. It may, it may not, it may lack absolutely, the humility of the Celts. So, yep, but, but so, yes, so, I but it is the same people. They, it is, it, 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 it is it, the Aaron. So if you go it, back if, and if, look, I, if I could, if I could add one more thing about this notion that transhumanism yeah. is somehow detached from nature. I, I, it is in many ways, uh, obviously putting fucking chips in your head and cutting your arm off to create a bionic arm is pretty fucking unnatural. Uh, at the same time, if you look at some of the heaviest thinkers that they may not identify as transhumanists, but they're certainly on that bent, someone like Kevin Kelly, right? The whole earth catalog guy, uh, the wired magazine, either editor or certainly long-term contributor for a decade and a half plus Kevin Kelly describes this and others do Max Tegmar, others. He describes this progression into a hyper technologized to use a clunky term, hyper-technologized state of being for human beings and this sort of unification of the entire planet in this, this uh, cybernetic interconnected neo-universe, he sees this as just the natural extension of the natural world into human life. And is it, you know, we're sort of this, this, this screen through which nature is, you know, uh, filtering its, its primal drives to become the, the most possible interconnected and complex conscious being it can become. So it's not man against nature in this conception. It's man as the ultimate expression of nature and technology as being the next step in that ultimate expression and ultimately replacing you know, human beings. It's in fact, transhumanism, at least the post-human version of it, um, is profoundly anti anthro it's, 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 it's very much about self-sacrifice in order for this higher being to rise up. I'm reminded of like Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising, those early scenes with the volcanoes and the Egyptians. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, like, but it's progressive. So it's, it's like Ken Wilber and from like Dust to Deity. Yeah, yeah so it's... It's, it's this progressive idea that there's this evolution to a Godhead. So it's, you know, to Homo Deus, as uh, Harari says. But so this is a very old idea, but it's an Aryan idea. And the very, uh, the proof of it is, is if you have a look in, uh, in Hindu uh, philosophy, you have the concept of a yantra. A, a yantra is a machine. The very first mention of machine comes from the Aryans. And the machine was basically this vehicle for self-transformation. So they said that the, you, you create the machine, and the machine is how we get to Godhead. And so it, it's, it's a pure Aryan ideal. And, but here's the problem. It's, it's been known since the year dots to be... Uh, pure hubris. So it's been known to to be the death of of anybody that tries to go down that path. So you, the very first work of literature is um, in the Iranian. It's uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the story of Gilgamesh is exactly this. It's basically the how he seeks immortality through human ingenuity, and he fails miserably. And the salvation is to understand that no. You're mortal, it's better that way, and you just learn to accept it and integrate yourself with, with nature. And I think that's the, the thing that will kill us is our immortality drive, and that's what's going to kill all these guys that are on this transhuman trip. They, they're on the forbidden trip to immortality. Well, uh, I, I, don't, I don't anticipate they're going to succeed anytime soon. So 
Uh, I, honestly, no, they're going to kill us all. They're going to kill us all trying to get there. <laughs> uh, they may take a few. Hopefully not me. Um, so, and, and hopefully not you. Uh, I, now, now that I know you, I, I'm fundamentally invested in you not, uh, you know, getting chipped against your will or turned into Soylent Green or, God forbid, you know, picked up by Interpol or something for something you said on YouTube. Uh, be careful what you fucking... They already uh, chipped me. They, they, they already chipped me. Get out! Get out! Get out! Sorry. <laughs> I slipped into the wrong movie. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I do... I think if you, yeah, please, go ahead. if you do any flash photography, I start saying get out a lot, you know. But I think what you what you said, Hugh, in previous interviews about the format of our long conversation makes us much less um in danger because of the dilution of little words in long, long conversations instead of short little you know videos. It only takes, it only takes one ping. Ah yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you are the we first one who mentioned. You are the first one who mentioned uh, TK uh, in the conversation. We said Uncle. <laughs> yeah, well, we you can't. Uncle you, you you can't talk about uh, Lud. You know, you can't talk about Ludism or you know. I you know I'm a failed Luddite. Obviously, I mean, look at me. Um, but uh, you can't talk about the problems that. Uh, at least techno skepticism creates without bringing up old Teddy. You know, it, 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 he's, yeah. he's a, an yeah. albatross around our necks. Yeah, he's he, he's but, the Osama bin we, Laden we don't... of Luddism. Yeah, but but you can weave uh, that out of the story. You don't, you or you know, it's an advanced grade to get into that. Level. But anyway, we should we should possibly end it there. It's been wonderful to meet you, and I uh, would like to do it again. Um, I um, I would in, I really like it if you read through that document more and, and had a look at Bright Axiom and those guys that did, and and try get the idea of. Um, you know, how you can have a secret society. That's really kind of a joke in a way. Um, but it's it's kind of discordian and it's kind of um, countercultural. And it's it's a way of making people think of an, of an alternative to this dry story. I, I think um, yeah, I'll definitely have a look at it. It looks interesting. I think uh, Sophie may have already hit upon the solution, uh, even if uh, it, even if you do fear the incursion of the drones but you said you have a garden on an island in ireland well yes yes uh, well I, i'm not on an island anymore but i'm on a peninsula yeah it's the yeah but you know i mean i'm i'm tributary to the to the to warming to 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 all sorts of of other conditions that you know my survival could be suddenly compromised by changes in temperatures and and all sorts of things that might come from from uh, from the tech industry so you know it's all it's all connected it's all connected it's nothing is perfect well keep keep the walls up keep the walls high yeah yeah, yeah and you too and uh, good luck good luck for everything you're doing and thank you for your writings and uh, hopefully we might we might meet again um you know um if yeah we'll uh, we we will probably we will probably well, we'll post. Not, uh, we'll post. Hopefully, it, it won't we'll, be we'll in post some sort of matrix right like and, um, environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, we are. Look at us. We, we're sitting oh here in the matrix right now. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. But, you know, listen. What I say is you've got to fight I, it from within. Man. I, I, I never. Uh, the first time I ever did Zoom was. You know, maybe six or seven months into the pandemic, um, the third time or fourth time I ever did a video kind of conferencing, uh, it was on live television. You know, and uh, I would say that at this point, this is maybe fifteen or or so times that I've ever done this. Like I've I've, I've been so averse to this entire fucking trend. Uh, I've managed to avoid it, and hopefully I'll, I'll drop out of it as soon as I possibly can. But um, 
it is a very weird mode of consciousness, isn't it? it it's disgusting. It's obscene. But it, it, we must put you in um, touch with Mark Boyle. Yes, as, as well. I if I if I can get so, your I get your email off you, and I will send you. Um, sure. Links to Mark Boyle's works. Uh, he's a local. He's an Irish guy. He's a he's a guy who lives off grid, and uh, uh, he doesn't have any tech at all. No phone. No nothing. So, but uh, he's written a few good books, and I will. And I will. He lived. To, hmm? He li he lived for about ten years with no money, right? I mean, no, no. He, he lived he, a he's, year he's without known money. He's the no before. money guy. Moneyless man. But he only did a year without the money, and then with the money, he bought a. He bought a little farm place and uh, he built his cabin. And now he's been uh, four years without tech and electricity, phone, car, nothing, no running water. But he's it's it's a long story. But, and, uh, yeah. But I I beat him. I've been two years but without I money. Just now. Have, I just got a letter. I, I, I beat him then. I've, I've been two years without money. I, he uses the post, and that's the only way. I just got a letter from him, and I still can't manage to get him online. But he does sometimes interview, so I'm not giving up. On the idea of uh, inviting him, so uh, we'll see. We'll see. Well, maybe you can track him down in person, huh? Oh, I've been to his place a couple of times. Uh, oh, I, there I, you go. I, I missed that part of the story. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, you don't need to. You don't need to drag him into this god awful medium. Uh, it yeah, sounds yeah, like he's doing. Sounds like yeah. he's doing all right. Yeah, he he keeps away. Uh, he has other. Well, you see, when you have to do every day, go and fetch your water at the well. When you have to cut your wood, when you have to go and fish your, uh, get your meal in the lake, when you have to, your your day is is spent at, and slowly, you know, without distractions, but you still have a physical investment in in everyday living that is, you know, enormous. Uh, and then you you're tired because you go to bed like the hens and you wake up early and you know you just don't have any. Uh, you don't have any uh, time to to spend really uh, he does a lot of contemplation he does a lot of you know like what i do really sitting out and admiring the beauty where we live uh you know but yeah i haven't given up on going to visit him with a laptop and trying to get him out of his compound where there's no he doesn't want any electronics in the compound uh but we for him. yeah 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 oh yeah 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 that's the rules there's no mobiles either on the on the place you he, he hear like yeah he has a, an old pig barn that is is refurbished to make it into a free hostel where it's not advertised but people can go and it's called a happy pig and people go in there and stay for nothing and they go and weed the garden or they help him to cut wood or just bring something and you know in exchange and you can stay there as long as you like so he's got he has a contact with the outside world which is a real contact which is people and you know yeah so hmm. that's wonderful i'd say you'd like I, it I, so, yeah. Sophie, uh, how do you how do you say goodbye in the celtic tongue i don't know because i don't have irish so you know, I know I don't. I, I'm originally French, and so I didn't. Well, have the French, the, the French were Celts too. You should surely have some sort yeah. of. Yeah. So resonance. we say slan. We say slan, and that's 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 usually the 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 way we say hello and we say goodbye here in Ireland. Slan. Mm. Slan. Okay. Well, in that case, slan, Sophie. Namaste, and Lord Hugh. So, <laughs> uh, so, so just one question. I have to ask before you go: Is, is are you related to uh, Dave Allen at all? Um, no. <laughs> now, for, for, for reasons, so, yeah, for, I mean, the for, for complicated reasons, uh, I'm not related to many Allens directly. Just, just checking. Okay, well, it's been wonderful to to meet up with you. <laughs> It's uh, it's very nice to make contact, so we must keep in touch. It's very, very good to have you on. It's, it's been it's been fascinating. Uh, it, I, you you can uh, cut out any of that Ted Kaczynski stuff. I don't need that. I don't need that kind of rap. But um, <laughs> but 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 it's all in your court. I've said nothing that uh, that I'm ashamed of. That's for damn sure. So hey, mm -hmm. namaste, both of you. Thank you. Very bye bye. Speak. Namaste. Bye-bye.
Oh, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I did a 